I would like to open it up with the paraphrasing the words of the poet that if the doors or the windows of perception to be cleaned, the world will appear as it is perfect. You have heard that line maybe, we have spoken that line, you may have come across that line. It sounds lovely, but at the same time, it has that air of perplex perplexing logic. You know, how, how can the world be perfect? Hmm? Infinite. This Alan just reminds me that the world, will everything will appear as it is infinite. But perfect is just as fitting here. So, this perplexity of what goes on in our perception that colors it to such degree that that infinite somehow is being completely eclipsed by the finite experiences, by the finite nature of that what comes and goes. Therefore, at some point, sooner or later, every advanced seeker of truth or any advanced finder of truth, any advanced sadhaka, comes face to face with that necessity of the refinement of perception. Because it is in the refinement of perception that things appear as they are. In their fullness. And that what in turn simply translates as the fullness of experience. That fullness of experience is on the account of the fullness of perception. So if perception, perception is partial, then that, whatever we experience, whatever we perceive, will always remain partial. It may seem a bit of a catch-22, because also we know that we are not in terms of others, but the world or everyone else is in terms of ourselves. Therefore, perception, whenever that is spoken in relation to subject-object relationship, is the indicator of the intimacy between that subject and the object of experience. Whatever that object may be. It is the intimacy or in the intimacy where things reveal their full nature and shine in full glory. In full glory of that what the creative dynamics between subject and object is really bad. Object here is not limited to objects. It's not limited to a tree or a bird or a planet as it is perceived 
object here is also obviously all that is reachable with the senses through the organs of cognition, sound, touch, taste. And it includes the thought as an object of our contemplation. So it's in that refinement, in the refinement that tuning, in the tuning that this is being resolved. And whatever is some, something out of tuning, as we know, doesn't allow the natural harmony of whatever that is. We may have a most amazing instrument, And that, unless that instrument is tuned, there's really, really little can be extracted from that instrument. Be it a handmade, man-made instrument, or a voice. So, this is a useful reminder about the progressive nature of all awakenings progressive nature of all unfoldments, so that we have clearer perspective in terms of where and how everything unfolds. We can see this in, we can almost, if there is a need to see this in that um, synthesized way, there is a need to see this in that, from that above, kind of hovering perspective, map-like, to give us a great idea, in retrospect, as it were. Spiritual unfoldment follows this certain trajectory. First, there has to be some degree of internalization. So if our awareness is always extroverted, always extroverted, then one way or the other, there is not even a propensity to acknowledge what is going on, let alone have any inclination towards that what spiritual work or the process of reclaiming one's essence really represents. So if one's awareness is dominated by extroverted mo mode at all times, it doesn't matter. We get tired in we retire, you know, we take a nap, we go to sleep, we dream, we have deep sleep, come out, immediately it's extroverted. It's extroverted in every way. Very little reflection. Very little reflection. Very little introversion. Prana is simply oozing out of its approaches. All the time. Prana is, as it were, goes in every direction outward outward. It's, this is the way we are designed. There's no such thing as extroverted awareness without the prana oozing out, streaming out, leaking out, going out. Because even for the senses to enjoy the organs of cognition need to be charged. Obvious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the organs of cognition are here supplying all that. But in order to supply, there needs to be some, some charging, some electrical charge. So this is all performed by 
various pranic flaws. So the beginning of the journey really is a greater and greater degree of internalization when this propensity to go inward and propensity to experience this counter movement counter to the extroverted awareness when that flow of introverted awareness <coughs> becomes a necessity. When that becomes a necessity, people become meditators. It doesn't matter how, what will be the... doesn't matter what will be the inspiration, insight or trigger. It will happen. Even if someone is not going to be introduced to meditation. One will be introduced into meditation spontaneously. One will find, find one way or the other, this interest, or rather the interest will be driving force to find the way back in. And the greater the introverted wave, the greater it is accompanied by this realignment of prana. Because in the human organism, this is exemplified in this possibility where awareness, once it reached fullness of its self-expression in terms of these creative outpourings and the process of evolution now brought about the possibility for awareness to fall back onto itself in that larger circle. And in the human being and through human being, through human physiology, awareness can know itself as it were. So therefore, it is for the right reason that it is spoken of as re, reclaiming, realizing. It's a realization. It's a regaining something which has been temporarily lost. Okay, we have adopted this esoteric perspective. We have adopted this philosophical grounds that everything is consciousness. That would mean that consciousness is all there is. Awareness is all there is. That means awareness is as much in the granite as it is in the elephant and in the lizard and in the bunny, in the tree and in the moon and in the sun and in any anything that we can speak of. All this, this, is awareness and nothing else. But in the granite, in the elephant, and even in the moon, and even in the sun, awareness is concealed from its fullness of self-reflection. And only in the human being that possibility is being reintroduced where awareness can fall back on itself and shine in full glory as it is even, even amidst this continuity of experience. This is of tremendous significance, what we just spoke. It's of tremendous significance because this is one of the late motives of all perennial traditions. <coughs> and in some of them, this is 
the main emphasis that this rehabilitation takes place in the human body. Awareness doesn't suffer in the rock. It doesn't suffer in the <coughs> elephant. It doesn't suffer in any form that it may take. In any form. Let it be very clearly understood. It doesn't suffer. It's just in the rock. Awareness has that rockiness of the rock. <coughs> beingness, beingness in the rock in an elephant, fully conceals awareness from itself on the account of that fullness of that experience of being a rock, being an elephant, being a mountain, being a blade of grass. But in human being, this affair turns into something else entirely. In a human being, the possibility is created or the possibility is available where that, what is by virtue of evolution, now has reached this profound state of refinement on the account of the nervous system being capable of vibrating with such refined frequencies that it can be at once contemplating its own essence whilst going busy about the beauty and the physicality of the manifested plane of creation. And it is that what has been emphasized again and again, that that possibility is of utmost value. And this is where the scale, if you will, have been introduced, levels layers, scales have been introduced. Human life can proceed in such way that that evolutionary refinement is foregone, not actualized, foregone. And the propensity of what otherwise also has precedence towards the physicality of experience takes over an evolutionary possibility is thwarted. Because this propensity will, if you will, drag consciousness back down in that state where it will subject it to the dormancy. Not every spiritual tradition agree exactly on the concept and how it works when it comes to incarnation or reincarnation. But if we are to look at it from the perspective, let's say, which is uniquely known in Indian subcontinent, then it is that what becomes very important. Because in a human being, the human incarnation is not considered to be a trivial affair. Because if the evolution for what it presents is not actualized, then it is not granted that that evolution will be sustained and given a limitless, innumerous number of chances for it to refine itself. Yes, there is also this understanding that everything eventually <clears throat> has to evolve. Everything will evolve. Everything will evolve. But when it comes to the affair of the human body, here, because of the complexity of the experience, the nature of the way the mind has the capacity to project. Because mind is the most powerful tool, the most powerful lens 
of consciousness at the individual level, it is not guaranteed that every, every movement will be in evolutionary direction. Therefore, it may come across as kind of a reminder and a warning that all do not just bypass this in a human body. When examined from this point of view, then it is apparent that the human affair is a balancing act, in fact. It can go anywhere from here. Anywhere. In a donkey, in a tree, it will continue, continue in the upward direction. But in a human being, affairs are different. In a human being, everything is possible. So, this propensity to internalize the awareness, that catching the wave of internalization, which is accompanied or maybe even driven by the realignment of pranic currents, is the beginning of <coughs> spiritual refinement, is the beginning of spiritual transformation. So from there, the possibility is created where that what has been in dormancy, that what has been enjoying the status quo, has the possibility to open up to itself. This is what we call awakening. And then it's spoken in differently, you know, soul awakening, one awakens to one's reality, one awakens to the possibility of shift in perception, where that shift from individually gripped affairs, there is this expansiveness instead experienced, <coughs> transparency instead experienced, a luminosity instead experienced. One still lives in the body, one still subjected fully to that what it represents. But there is this, what again falls under the category of refinement. If before I feel well and I feel unwell, all in relation to the body, all of the time in relation to the body. And we say the body, we means body-mind. We don't draw a differentiation here at all. Everything is spoke. I feel great today. I feel great. Feel lots of energy. You know, I feel fantastic. It's only spoken in relation to this body-mind conglomerate. Oh, I feel under the weather. Oh, I feel fantastic. All this is constantly, constantly spoken in relation to the body-mind. But in the one in whom this begins to unfold, and different frequencies of vibration brings about a more refined state, then that transparency, that luminosity, cannot be even easily defined what it is in relation to. And if then we are given to some insights, if this is also accompanied by the desire to understand, the mm -hmm. desire to have an articulated conformation of these very, very subtle experiences, then one 
begins to gain true insight accompanied by first hand experiencing of that luminosity of that transparency and it is that transparency and that luminosity that's what brings about that incredible lightness of being and even the ups and downs I experienced in a different way. The point of perception has shifted. And as the journey unfolds, and this phase we speak of as the space, phase of purification, the phase of shedding of that what outlived removing the dead wood from the garden of Eden that what essentially simply known as trapped forms of energy all that all that brings about tremendous sense of realignment 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 and that realignment is part and parcel of all home homecomings this realignment so this phases of relieving certain experiences relieving certain undigested impressions relieving certain traumas all part and parcel of that process of that phase as well when enough material that has been sitting in the psychic centers is being released when enough of that has been essentially reabsorbed back into the fabric of our awareness <clears throat> the world gains a very different flavor and this phase heralds the phase of a repose well, first of all before we say that maybe we should say that the unfoldment <coughs> is inseparable from the progressive purification of the psychic centers unfoldment of any sort is the continuous purification of the information which is contained in every psychic center and the kind of material kind of information that is contained in each and every psychic center is subject to the universal law of creation of how each and every center becomes the dwelling place of and the expressive potentiality of that great elemental order so this unfoldment is twofold always expansion of consciousness and ascent of consciousness is inseparable from greater metabolic activity on the subtle level when this all being metabolized all that has been in the somehow experienced but haven't had the chance to be fully integrated would have to be integrated now and that integration 
can take many different forms, many different ways. For someone, it would be accompanied by more phys physical processes. For someone, the emotional side will be the driving force and the emphasis as well. For someone, this would be experienced at the level of increased action, activity in the world. Maybe mentally as well. For someone, it will be experienced in various forms of rekindled creativity. <coughs> For someone, it will be experienced in the form of certain gifts. All these are varieties of psychic phenomena that is being brought now to the surface level of affairs, where something needs to be re-experienced so as to fully get reabsorbed back into the fabric of our awareness. So nothing seems alien, nothing, nothing seems as not part of what we are, of who we are. And then the repose. This process of repose, like a rest, like a deep rest. In that repose, we get disentangled untangled and unplugged from a lot of conditioned connections down to the neurological level of the functioning of our mental emotional activity. It's unplugging in a real sense, unplugging this if this is understood, it's a wonderful vacation, wonderful time of vacation. It's going on a vacation and leaving no number to anyone, no, nowhere to call. It's not retirement, it's simply taking time off. And everything is, has the auto-reply. Every message that comes to you already auto-replied. I'm out of the office. See you when I'm back. <coughs> kind of thing. And that repose is a very important phase because this is where less a possibility for being sucked in back into the same network of that, what all this work was about. All this work was about, but unplugging did not take place fully, or did not take place fully enough. And unless the process is so <coughs> intense, then nothing one can do anyway. One would not be able to do anything at that point of what is now up to me or not up to me. But if it's not, then there is always this propensity to for these connections that weakened and a lot of work that has been done one will be replugged back in and, and very quickly it reconfigures itself without real fundamental changes. And this is a stuff of a lot of awakenings. A lot of awakenings have precisely this fate is because there haven't been enough of that repose there haven't been enough of that 
creating new connections because the unplugging is accompanied by natural propensity to have some connections. There have to be some associations on the inside, associations right, of the neuro, neurons and peptides, how they connect to the in the cortexes. And these associations, of course, are in the way we go about our life, with whom we associate, with whom we liaise, with whom we share. This is, this is something that may be rarely spoken, but it's a matter of fact. Therefore, some spiritual approaches and some spiritual traditions more zealous about these phases, more unapologetic, maybe even more strict, maybe more protective. There is an ashram phase of life. There is this phase of life when one needs to be very attentive, where one will be sucked in back into that matrix of the world. And it takes colossal amount of complete and utter independence to be able to be sucked back into the world but remaining as a walking universe entirely independent from any any prevalent vibrations, prevalent conditionings. Everything is here ruled by likes, increases likes. Can you imagine the amount of independence it takes where one is not, not succumbed to the prevalent vibrations? It takes some form of independency. That's what we call independent spirit. The independent spirit does not know the conformity. Even if going about daily life as normal. But that is on the account of what we just spoke. If that level has not been reached, then the propensity would be very quickly be replugged, and all this, what all the spiritual work was about, would be revived, reconfigured with tremendous force. And you meet a lot of people for whom this whole spiritual awakening remains to be an enigma. And if they are sincere within themselves, then there is this admonition that all that I went through, all that, what was it for? I'm back to the same person I was. So this is the phase of the repose. That the repose is precisely for remaining in that where new connections can be made. This is the phase where we are advised, encouraged to befriend the unknown, to befriend the uncertainty. Because the certainty would drive us back to the tried and tested. It is the certainty with a shadow of fear standing right by it, will push us, provoke us to have that jerking movement of back to the known, back to what we have always considered to be safe, secure. And this is a stuff of legend. It's proverbial and could be simply scrutinized to the internal, internality of the processes, of why that is. New connections haven't been established yet. New connections haven't been fully plugged in yet. And the old connections have not been given chance to die away, outlive themselves. And as has been said a moment earlier, Unless the process has the intensity, when the unplugging has no one 
to have anything to say about it. It's just done and done with, which in many, many cases is more preferable because then we are in the hands of that invisible power. This is thy will be done. That is the proverbial, that old-fashioned, let thy will be done. Because my will has no power. And I am now fully in the acknowledgement that only thy will can do its way. So let me be fully, fully available, present. Let me be the instrument of thy will. So this repose then facilitates the process of descent. This is the return. Descent, return. It's the true integration, if we can ever speak about integration, because that return here is what brings about completeness of spiritual transformation. It brings about the full reclaiming and full merging, whilst at the same time it is known as the most natural of all states there are. The chief property of that state is spontaneity. It's a normal state of affairs, spontaneity. In Sanskrit, it's this freedom, svatantriya. It's the attribute of Shiva. It's attribute of pure awareness. It's ready to create at every split of a moment. It's actually constantly in a state of creative excitement, whilst that excitement does not take one from a state of plentitude. So it's like, imagine, it's like an artist who already painted that picture and could paint it at any time. It's inconceivable because it's not on the account of something lacking in me and I want to create it. It's on the account of something playful of me, and I want to play. But the picture is already painted. It's full picture. And only when it is full, the true creativity can take place. Because then, one can emphasize and enjoy and savor every single minute quality of that. Because before that, there was no choice. I'm only present to this sliver of experience, to this facet of experience. But now I freely choose what and how I want to experience this. This is a state of Svatantriya. So don't confuse it, please, with this, maybe some perspectives that one becomes the magician that one creates this and completely disregards the laws of nature and one can produce a diamond in the hand or one can just manifest things out of the thin air. It's from the within when there is no lack of anything. So it's the same as having everything turned into diamonds. It's the same as turning everything into pure gold, but not to be taken literally. It's being able to live 
the state of the monarch, the state of the sovereign, in any condition. Because one is the master of one's states. And that mastery is naturally translates in that creative play where every perception is now a conscious affair wherever one wants to draw one atten one's attention to. So this, this is the descent and reclaiming of all the faculties now, all the way down to the earth, if we speak to elemental order. So the state of complete reconciliation can only be experienced in the completeness of that return. Therefore, this is spoken of as descent, great descent. So, you can see this now in this beautiful <coughs> retrospect. It's like, it's the descent of grace in the first place. The descent of grace that touches this inert matter with its magical touch, which facilitates the ascend and expansion of consciousness. And once consciousness reaches its apogee, once consciousness is fully unfolded, it then descends again. Now to reclaim this, what prior to that was but inert matter on the account of our experience, to divinize it, this is the perspective which is worth contemplating on. So therefore, it is in some traditions, in Indian tradition, in Indian tradition, this is unapologetically known as this. The whole purpose of this is divinization of the world, which otherwise is inert. It goes about its own affairs, as it were, until the divine quality is being fully returned, fully given its fullness of possibility. So, somewhere in this very simple, simply sketched out, unfoldments in stages, the refinement of perception is the absolute necessity. So this refinement of perception is here the advanced work. So awakening is when we ride you know, when we ride the waves of that grace, grace is here or on the account of what have you, or there is some effort, and awakening presents itself for what it is. But if we are to make something out of it, if it's to truly, truly, bear the fruit, then all awakenings will be but a memory, unless it is accompanied and completed by these progressive phases of refinement. 